we meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. So you're here today with Jennifer Hiller, who's a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. And her, one of her focuses is on energy. So thank you so much for uh, taking the time to join us. Thanks so much for having me on. Yes. So before we get into the present day topics, we'd love to get to know you a little bit. Tell us, where'd you grow up? I am in Houston, actually, uh, in the, we've got uh, Wall Street Journal offices here and we all focus on energy. Uh, we've got people obviously in other parts of the world who cover energy as well, but most of the Houston team is uh, primarily energy focused, either in utilities or oil and gas. And, and where are you from originally? Oh, I'm from Houston. You're from Houston too? <laughs> yes. And, and what was it like there? And anything about that area that kind of led you down the space of becoming a reporter? Uh, I, I'm not sure if it's anything about Houston in particular. I definitely grew up in a newspaper reading family. So that helped, I think, set me on the path. And, and, and when did you decide to make that your career? I guess in college. I, you know, I changed my major like everybody <laughs> does probably four or five times in college, but I started off in journalism and then circled back around to it, I guess, by my junior year. And, and in something? high school, that's what I had wanted to do. In high school as well, because well. it goes all the way back to high school. Yeah. And did it come from a love of writing specifically, a love of reading, maybe just like that creative part of your brain? I think both, both reading and writing. And, um, and the topics that you covered, let's say post-university, what was the range there? Oh my goodness. I was all over the map in terms of what, I covered, I started off at small newspapers. And so I did a lot of local politics, local government, some state government. I was an education reporter for three years. I covered real estate for several years, uh, but I definitely had some, you know, sort of small town beats as a young reporter where you just covered whatever was going on. If it was, uh, you know, an accident or something with the school or a murder trial or just whatever was happening. And um, when different topics, does it require different writing style? In fact, do you have to like change up how you present the case to the audience? I don't think so. You know, I mean, I think on some topics, maybe you have to work a little bit harder to find your audience or just to explain things. But I think if you write, if you've got a good story and a good topic, I think people will, I think people will read it. I don't know. I'm the kind of reader well, that I will just, I'll pick up anything. And if it's well done, then I'll, I'll stick with it and learn something. Yeah. And you're talking about even through like books and everything. Yeah, I think so. And um, what about the different uh, publications the, when you come, when you go from one publication to another, actually, we'd love to hear kind of like, I, I know you spent some time at the San Antonio Express. Was that where the majority of your early career was? Yeah, I spent several years there and I covered real estate for a while. And then I switched over to energy coverage, actually, when the Eagle Ford Shale uh, became really big. And that would have been, I think I probably started covering oil and gas around 2011 and it was mostly because there was an oil boom going on south of town and nobody knew what was going on down there so they pulled me off of real estate and because I had done one story about 
how all the hotel rooms were booked and people were sleeping in their trucks and in, you know, on the mattresses of boarding house floors and things like that, because there was so much work in wow. South Texas and you could not find, uh, you know, an apartment or a house wow. or a hotel. And so I had done this one story just about, gee, this is crazy. <laughs> There's all these people trying to work in South Texas and nowhere to stay. And, and how so come that's how I ended up covering oil and gas because my editor said, great, just go down there and keep writing stories. That's so, cool. And yeah. I remember uh, during the later shale boom in like North Dakota and everything, I remember reading similar stories like exorbitant rates for lodging, but I never understood that because why wouldn't then a bunch of people that have like mobile homes just drive them, drop them off and rent them for a thousand bucks a month or something. Well, that, you know, that happens in, in a lot of places. And that certainly happened in South Texas. Um, and, and it happened, you can see it in kind of all the shale fields and in West Texas and Eastern New Mexico, but it takes time. And so there's just this lag, but absolutely. You saw people who, you know, even people who might have a couple of acres of property who, you know, I met families who had, you know, they would take, you know, an acre or two of it, clear it, you know, get the utilities out there and basically create this pop-up RV park. Right. Uh, but you couldn't find, I mean, people were buying FEMA trailers. You could, you could not, uh, you could almost not find stuff fast enough to put it down there. And a lot of the communities had, you know, these are very rural communities um, where maybe the largest town is you know somewhere between you know five and ten thousand people so there's not a lot of hotels some of right. these you know some of the counties that saw a lot of oil and gas activity you might have a couple of hotels or one hotel or something in the entire county so there's just physically nowhere to put people and you know a lot of rural communities and, and i think this is probably in the case in a lot of areas they don't have enough housing as it is and then you send a bunch of people there so it can be a strange but energy is a strange thing those strange yeah. things the communities and um i uh, so okay so you switched over to oil and gas because of that was there a steep learning curve just kind of getting all the vernacular down yes <laughs> i think so yeah i think there's a, a learning curve for energy Definitely. And I remember talking to my editor about that, um, saying, I, you know, I'm going to be on a learning curve here. And the response was, well, you picked up real estate right away, you know, won't have a problem. And I thought, yeah. oh, this is going to be a disaster. I'm going to do this for a few months and then I'm just going to go get another job somewhere else. Oh, you stuck <laughs> but, with it. but I stuck with it. I ended up really liking it a lot, but it is, um, you know, it's a fun, it, it ended up being a really fun thing to, to write about and learn about energy is just a really dynamic industry. It, it's so funny just the way you brought that up with your editor, because I feel like I have that conversation a lot too, like with an employee, they'll be like, okay, there's going to be a steep, I'm more warned here, there's going to be a steep learning curve. And then my response is always like, I hired you because you're smart, you'll figure it out, like stop <laughs> bothering me. It sounds yeah, like I think that time. was that was my yeah, I think that was my editor's response. It's just like that's your job. You're a reporter. Go, you know, we, we should be able to drop you in anywhere. And truly, yeah. if you're smart and if you're yeah, most people can can find their way around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so then how did oil and gas turn into broader energy? What were some of the other topics that you had to cover and what how did that progress? I think. I think the energy space has just changed and become so much more dynamic the last couple of years. And you have all different kinds of companies making investments in energy. And there's just a lot of focus on, on renewables and the energy transition and where all different kinds of companies, you know, energy or, or other types of companies fit into the mix going forward. So I feel like there's a lot of conversations happening more broadly about energy in a way that, you know, maybe weren't being talked about five or 10 years ago. And it seemed like, and just, it seemed like different parts of the energy business were a little bit more siloed mm -hmm. before. And now you see, um, you know, oil and gas companies making renewables investments or, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about things like pairing 
hydrogen uh, with with wind, um, which is you know kind of an a, you know an oil pairing of an oil and gas type area with a renewable. Uh, so I think I think there's a lot of crossover. I guess over the years you probably inter interviewed a bunch of executives in the oil and gas space, and then kind of just seeing how the how the 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 positioning of these companies has changed to more of like adopting clean energy technologies in their portfolio as well, as you just mentioned. Have you seen kind of like a change in tune from people that you know and that you've been talking to for a decade? Have you have you just like watched them be like, wow, I never would have expected you to say that? You know, yes and no. I think at the heart of it, oil and gas companies are going to keep producing oil and gas. I think that I think that maybe the biggest change has has been coming from investors forcing the conversation of you know what are what are your emissions and how are you lowering those emissions and those conversations i feel like have changed a lot where not very many years ago if if a if an oil and gas company or really any company was putting out a carbon report that was kind of a big deal and then i feel like every year you see companies spending more and more time publicly talking about, uh, you know, their footprint or attempts to lower their footprint and um, not just on emissions, but on water use and other things. And so I feel like that's just entered the conversation in a very different way. And, and it, maybe a few years ago, I think for a lot of companies, it was kind of, oh yeah, on their slide deck, maybe at the very end, if they had a couple of slides about you know environmental topics or about um, you know emissions and carbon reporting that was probably considered a lot or they were maybe kind of out there <laughs> compared to some of their their other colleagues and now it's very routine I think but I mean at the heart of it I don't know how much you're going to see uh, you know companies actually change their trajectory of what their core business is. Um, but I, I think there's definitely an acknowledgement that there's sort of a different different world that we're living in. Yeah. And um, just in terms of like the type of reporting that you do, is it always like, does it always have to start with like this event happened? Or do you have the, the freedom to explore like a broader thesis and just write about a topic more broadly? I mean, it, you know, we do a mix of coverage. There's always events in, in journalism. There's always, you know, some kind of event that will spur a story and, and breaking news will happen that you have to respond to. But you know, usually the better stories are the ones where people have spent a little bit of time thinking about it or you found data or sometimes you hear things. Um, you know, maybe here and there in different conversations. And, and those tend to be, I think, the, the more fun stories to read, you know, for readers and, yeah. and to write as well that, you know, or maybe something that people haven't thought about before. Yeah, absolutely. Um, tell me about the transition to the Wall Street Journal. So I joined this summer and it's been great. It's been kind of my own personal energy transition because <laughs> I'm doing more renewables and utilities coverage, which I have done some of in the past, but that hasn't been my main focus. And so that's been really fun actually to, uh, you know, kind of get to dive in more on a different part of the energy system. And everything is so wrapped up and tangled up together and nothing is really an island, but uh, I've been I've been doing my own energy transition. Yeah, that's that's super cool. And does that come from like editorial direction? H how much of anything that you write about comes from you pitching an idea versus the editor saying this is something we want you to look into? We do a lot of both of those. Uh, there's a lot of discussion always with your editor about things that you're seeing, things that they're seeing uh, about, you know, just where, where good stories might be. But it's very, it's a very, I guess, collaborative kind of process. It's pretty rare to just start 
you know, start writing and working on something without at least bouncing it off of, of your editor. And um, my editor's great and has been editing energy a long time. And so you know, usually, you know, I always want to bounce things off of him and have that discussion because he's got great, great ideas and a good perspective on, you know, questions that we might want to ask. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and then how does it work just for my own personal edification? When I see like one, one um, author on an article versus several authors, like how is the work chopped up and divided? Is it like you write this paragraph, you write this paragraph, or do you have to like get on a whiteboard and brainstorm? Like what's happening there? Usually we're just dropping, you're either emailing each other or we're dropping things into a shared document. And it's more a function of- And who sets the narrative? Usually, I mean, you, you, the, whoever the lead byline is, is, is the person who's pulled the most that, who has pulled the most of I that see. So it's literally the together. order, it's the order of just whatever names are up there. Yeah. Okay, in okay. general, in know. general. So usually the lead byline has done, they've done more work and, but yeah, it's not a, it's not a super formal process of you write this part, I'll write this part. It's more just you know, either you're dividing and conquering to get something done quickly, or people have different areas of expertise a lot of times. And so maybe you're, uh, maybe I know something about a project that's happening in the US and I pair up with somebody in London who um, can provide, you know, what's going on in the UK and Europe. And so you're just coming at it with, you know, different, uh, you know, different sourcing and kind of that different perspective and then working it together. And the editors are always helpful with that as yeah. well. Um, speaking of collaborating with London, one of the articles that you wrote that I like gravitated towards um, was on you know, the, the, the UK's trend towards uh, adding more nuclear. Um, nuclear is a topic that we've been trying to explore because we think it's like kind of unfairly disparaged and just such like a critical tool in the clean energy transition. So we try to give it like extra coverage. I'm wondering, do, do you have the same impression that like nuclear isn't reported on as much? And, and what gave you kind of the confidence to like start writing on it? You know, I think, I, you know, it, it might be slightly undercovered compared to other, other forms of energy. I've heard that. I, you know, I have definitely heard that comment from people that that they feel like it doesn't get um, it doesn't get as much attention, but I think there's been so much growth in other areas that when it's you know wind and solar have been really booming, and you hear a lot about um, you know difficulties um, either in coal mining or at coal plants. Or I mean, there's definitely been some narratives that have been very dominant in in the in the power industry for the last several years and so yeah i don't know maybe nuclear just they're plugging along or you know having plant closures hasn't gotten the same level of attention i don't know it's an interesting it is an interesting space and it's interesting to see um you know maybe it, if things are getting reconsidered or if people are pursuing projects in a different way because it does when you look at the outlook for nuclear it's just kind of this flat-ish line yeah. <laughs> that maybe yeah. goes up kind of a little tick <laughs> I know globally I know. and no and it's, so a, it's that, a real that's a real problem yeah I know. yeah I, know. And so, I mean but yeah. but that drop you know that's probably why if it hasn't gotten as many stories or maybe if the stories haven't gotten as much traction then it might it it might just be that that's not where a lot of investment dollars have gone recently. I don't and, know. That's a good question. Yeah. And then um, with the nuclear stories that you've written, what's the like? What's the origin? How did you decide to write on them? What What about like got you personally interested? That's such a hard question. <laughs> I because I don't often think about why am I writing the story usually it's just something that catches our attention that we find interesting yeah. and new and different 
Yeah. How does it catch your attention? Are people like writing into the paper? Like, I'm curious about this, or is it another journalist that's calling you up and saying, I'm hearing this. What do you think? Like, like, how does it catch your attention? Sometimes. I mean, we get pitched on stories quite, quite a lot. There's, you know, kind of a whole industry that pitches (laughs) stories (laughs) to us. And so you do have kind of a river of email coming in. Uh, you know, for story, like with story ideas or source suggestions and, and things like that. Um, So some is from stuff like that. Other things are just in conversation with sources and analysts um, who will mention, you know, who will mention something. But, you know, I think there's an audience certainly out there for stories about about nuclear and oh, other I couldn't agree topics. More. <laughs> yeah. you know, there's, I couldn't agree more. It does more, have some no. hardcore fans. It's got a hardcore fan base. <laughs> it's got some hardcore fan base. Unfortunately, it's like, boy, I mean, I, we've been interviewing people throughout the nuclear sector for quite a while now, and I've got some mixed feelings on some of the hardcore fans. I think like, like their instinct is correct, but I actually think in many cases their arguments are incorrect or like inconsistent with like a broader you know, whatever their broader uh, focus is. But I, I, th- I think that like hardcoreness stems from the fact that like some people naturally intuit that you can do so much with so little when it comes to nuclear energy, right? It's got like 3 million times the energy density advantage of, of fossil fuels, a thousand times less material than renewables on a per energy basis. So like, I think people know that and then they get frustrated and then, you know, that frustration manifests itself in, in, different, in different form factors. Yeah, I guess so. It's it's definitely it, it's definitely an interesting part of of the energy industry. And like you said, there's there's uh, you know, definitely a lot of hardcore believers, there's a lot of hardcore detractors. It's got some, you know, real positives and real negatives and that those seem to really polarize people, I yeah. think in different ways. Well, then the media should love it. (laughs) It does make it interesting. (laughs) Um, Okay, cool. And I mean, is this a topic that, so you've written a couple articles on it so far that I've I've really enjoyed. Uh, Is this a topic that you think you'll continue to cover moving forward as well? Like are, are there other ideas that are being floated by your desk? Yeah, we've got, we've got other stories in the works on, on nuclear that I, I can't get into in in much detail, but it's definitely an ongoing area of, of, I think it'll be an ongoing area of coverage, definitely. Yeah, and then what about just kind of more broadly the clean energy space? Are there other, I mean, I hear a lot about hydrogen. I hear a lot about different types of storage. So like not battery storage, but all sorts of other interesting ideas. Are these coming across your desk more and more as well? And, and how, how do you go about looking into them? If it's like futuristic, if it's like not, if there's not something really happening yet, you know, it's, but it's an idea, maybe it's a startup to raise some money or something. Like how, how do you go about writing about it? This is, I think, one of the most difficult areas of, being a reporter, because there are so many smart people out there doing cool things and founding companies that have these, you know, just wildly creative ideas and trying to sort out what's real or what's possible or what's likely, you know, to go towards adoption is really hard. So this is something that I struggle with personally all the time. Because there's, there's a lot of neat ideas and solutions out there. And it's really hard to figure out what could be scaled to be commercial or what, who has the right kind of, of backing. But, you know, I think you see this in, you see this in, in oil and gas as well. A lot of times people have really great ideas for mitigating methane. and uh, you know, it, and it sounds really neat, but in practice, who is going to let you on their remote oil field site to try it out, or who is going to let you test it on their multi-billion dollar refinery? Yeah. And that's a much harder, you know, trying to get some of this stuff uh, kind of tested out in the real world is, um, 
is really difficult, but there is so much there. Yeah, there is so much incredible tech going on right now. I'm glad you brought up that one. I mean, I rem it's something that like, I know it gets reported on every now and then, but I feel like there's still so many unknowns. I remember I used to run a drone company and we would have people approach us and say, hey, can you mount a methane sensor and fly over our pipelines? I'm like, why? And they're like, well, we actually don't know how much we emit. And I'm like, um, that's a problem because it's like, I think like the thresholds for when methane becomes worse than um uh, you know, burning CO2 is like at the 3% leakage mark, like might as well not even use, you know, natural gas if you're leaking more than 3%. And I think like they're reporting like 2% or whatever, but like, you know, it's more like 6%. So it's like, like, uh, can we figure this out? Right. No. And the drones paired with pipelines, I think is one of, you know, that I've, I've seen some companies out there doing that for several years now. And that seems like just a really smart use. And you don't get into that issue of I'm flying my drone over your billion dollar piece of equipment that you don't want it going down a smokestack or whatever the attorneys for, you know, your big industrial facility would dream up in terms of things to be worried about. Um, whereas, yeah, flying that pipeline route with a drone to check for leaks seems like a really good pairing that can you know is a realistic one too right that it it makes a lot of sense for everybody yeah and beyond what you're reporting on but just kind of like your general because given how much you read and how much you talk to people and how much you write you must have like a special like like mental framework for where you see energy going in general do you have any like just unique insights that maybe aren't fully fleshed out but that are trends that just beyond your reporting that you, like the public should be thinking about for where i think energy is going just in like just in general like unique ideas like you know if i were to take six months to just really dig into something here would be the topic Ooh, okay that's a good question I think I hear so much stuff about energy and read so much stuff about energy. This is gonna sound really probably quite dull, but one of the things that I always think is just that we have this amazingly complex energy system and how fast we can change that is really a big question. And yeah. there's a lot of talk about how we're gonna make this big transformation and and kind of overturn the way that we use energy and the way that we interact with energy and in you know it's one of those that i think the more you the more you know about how energy works you realize it's really hard to just yeah. upend the existing system that it's yeah. entrenched and it's been there for a hundred years and, and to just change all of the inputs from one thing to another are going to be, you know, that's a, that's a bumpy process. Yeah. That's not 10 years. That's a hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, I think one of the overarching things that. Yeah. That's such a great insight actually, because this is, this is a frustration I personally have when I hear about people talking about, I mean, okay, fine, whatever, like you know, you, you're going to create clean electricity. Great. Um, electricity is only a quarter of the carbon emission. So if you, it's one thing, if you just want to clean electricity, okay, great. I think you can do it. But then when it comes to decarbonizing everything else, if you're like, your goal is actually climate change, we need to be thinking just as much about that. And I don't like the line like, oh, well, we'll just electrify everything because I don't think that people realize how entrenched industrial processes are. And like, it's hard enough for you know, a chemical company to move from like this one thing that they've been doing, like you said, for a hundred years, to like even a slight variation of that. Yeah. And be willing to take the capital risk and be willing to like, you know, who knows what downstream it'll affect. And so I don't like the rhetoric of, well, we'll just electrify everything. And I don't think enough thought is being like put into, if we really do have to move things like quickly, what are like totally different strategies that we can employ to, to do that? Yeah, because there is, I mean, there's definitely a huge push towards electrification. There's, it kind of seems like every industry is trying to electrify 
in different ways. And, and so, I mean, there, I mean, it's, you know, stuff is changing and changing, you know, fairly rapidly, probably more rapidly than it has, has changed in many decades. Uh, but it also, yeah, it implies a lot of, of infrastructure on that electricity side that may or may not be, you know, that that's going to be difficult to, to update. And then you've got every, you've got so many countries either trying to kind of update their existing system or developing countries that are building out just the demand on, uh, the demand on companies that, that are supplying things like renewable power or cables <laughs> and transmission right. lines is exactly. really overwhelming. Yeah, has like anyone done the analysis on that? Just like if we did electrify everything and then had to build all these electric lines, let's just wave a magic wand and assume that the technology worked. What are the other infrastructure challenges? Like, could we even produce enough electrical transformers in this period of time? Like that kind of stuff. Like, do people look? People at that? do break those numbers down in different ways, and I think there's a lot of debate as well among. There's a lot of debate, I think, among analysts as to you know, basically how much power, how much more power will be needed or how we will be using that power. And if you can incentivize people to use it at particular times of day when you have excess power um, and, or when, you know, power is cheaper and more abundant. And yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of debate and questions about that. I have no idea. <laughs> um. Uh, as we wrap up, uh, are there other topics that are just of, like of keen interest to you that you're going to be looking forward to writing about? Oh my gosh, there's so much going on. There's Tell us. Not, give us, give us some of the laundry list. There's not enough time for all. There's not enough time for all of the stories. Um, one of the things that I'm currently fascinated by, and this isn't necessarily electricity focused, but all these supply chain problems that everybody's having, I know that all of those stories are kind of the same. And yet I will read any supply chain story yeah, <laughs> that well, anybody writes about any industry for some reason. I'm very fascinated about how we, uh, you know, just what the pandemic has done um, in to supply chains and how we're going to come out of that and just if if it's going to permanently change or speed up certain changes can you give us I, i'm personally curious about that as well can you just give me like the quick primer like what's going on with supply chain i mean basically the supply chain which you know is the is the system by which we move all of the raw materials and finished products around the world has been fouled up by the pandemic and once it got behind, basically catching up has proven to be, it sounds like exponentially more difficult than anybody who doesn't work in logistics, I think, thought that it Why? would yeah, what, be. What's the main issue to just catch I mean, up? You, you know, you have, it's, it's really everything, but it's the move, it's basically the movement of people and goods. Yeah. And and so once that gets behind, apparently we all have been working on this kind of just in time system yeah, yeah, yeah. where it's, no I mean, I'm in Houston. So when a hurricane is on the way, you know, we cannot all go fill up our gas tank and buy bottled water and canned goods at the same time because everything gets wiped out. And so I think, you know, there was a little bit of that impact going on, but it's interesting when you talk to companies that are um doing projects globally or are you know buying materials in one country moving it to a factory in the other they are having just intense delays at ports if you need to send a crew of people into another country often they are quarantined for a period of weeks and so it slows down things like uh you know installations of wind projects 
in certain, you know, in a lot of countries where you've got a lot of local labor that you can hire, but maybe you've got, you know, some folks who are specialized who have to go in to oversee that project. And so you've got, um, you've got crews that you're having to sort of house in another country in a, you know, kind of in a hotel quarantine situation for weeks. And so this just kind of cascades through everything. And it's like this giant domino effect that has gone on. And so the companies, uh, you know, it seems like all of the companies, uh, you know, at least that manufacture things are, you know, continue to be tearing their hair out, trying <laughs> to yeah. figure out how to move product. And, and then at the same time, transportation costs have gone up enormously and raw materials prices have gone up. So you have um, inflation in, in a lot of different segments as well. So it's a really, um, wow. it's a really difficult time. What, yeah. and what are people predicting? Are, are people predicting that it, it's just going to take years to recover from it? Or are people saying that now eventually it'll catch up and then it'll be back to usual? Or what are people saying? I think this is what is so interesting because earlier in the year, people had a lot more optimism and you heard a lot of companies talking about how by year end, this would you know maybe be looking a bit different. And now we're starting to get sort of warnings from companies that this is an issue that has not resolved and that they don't see resolving until at least late next year. And that um, some companies are saying things have gotten worse, not, not better. Wow. Um, and so at some point we do go back to having a more normal uh, flow of goods and services around the world. And at some point it does work itself out, but you know, what we are hearing from companies right now is that it has, you know, these issues have not resolved and, and aren't likely to in the next couple of quarters. And um, is there a lesson learned from it, do you think? I mean, do you think that we're going to reflect on this and say, okay, we need to like build some more buffer into the system, or even maybe the next time there's a pandemic, we have to like weigh the lockdown you know, benefits versus the cost of like all of these other things that you couldn't even possibly predict and, and maybe not be so quick to lock down? That's a good question. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of lessons learned from this. And at the same time, it's so hard to have, you know, a couple of years ago, you wouldn't imagine that companies would be dealing with these kind of issues. And yeah, so I don't know, maybe they're, I mean, certainly they're taking some sort of pandemic and emergency preparation lessons away, but maybe, who knows, maybe it will be more a lesson in flexibility or just emergency response to, uh, to sort some of these things out. Because I just, I don't know how predictable these scenarios would, would have been. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think in general, like, I don't like how so many things operate on such a thin margin, you know, like, I don't like, like, I feel like we need, do need to build a little bit more, like, even the hospitals, like, with COVID and everything, you know, apparently, like, they got pushed over their limits because they were operating at the limits, and, like, like, what's up with that? Like, we have all of these policies to protect us, we have national, you know, we spend a third of our budget on national security, we don't think about like resilience in like logistics as like a key part of our defense posture. Yeah, I mean, I think that just generally probably across industries, you don't overbuild. All right. Because in a normal market, you would be penalized for overbuilding and for having too much capacity. You know, if yeah. you have a factory, you yeah. want it to be running I guess so, but like in, in capacity the, at yeah. all times, you don't want to have extra or you don't want to have too much or too little. And so we have this kind of Goldilocks situation where just the right amount of stuff shows up everywhere at the right time. And that's what we're designed for. Yeah. It's just like, oh, man, because it's like, it's like our, our banking system, they're like mandated by the law to keep a certain amount of reserves. Like you could imagine for like ports being critical infrastructure. Like the government just says, we'll, you know, we'll help you out, but you got to keep 10% reserve always or something. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
I feel like there's a way to deal with this. <laughs> I'm sure there's very, very smart people <laughs> who, are, <laughs> who are trying to do that right now. Cool. Well, yes. Well, I look forward to reading what you write about it um, in the future. Uh, so at that, on that note, Jennifer Hiller, thank you so much for joining us today. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much. I appreciate being here. And initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversation. If the world is to take off the inertia imposed by fear and is to make positive progress toward peace.